Good evening, everyone. Good evening. On behalf of the Center for Brooklyn History, the Brooklyn Public Library, and BPL Presents, which is the arts and culture arm of the library, I am so delighted to welcome you here to CBH, the Center for Brooklyn History. My name is Marcia Eli. Tonight is the culmination of many months of planning and collaboration. I want to give a special thank you to our program partners at WNYC, The Nation, and my colleagues at the Center for Brooklyn History for the hours of thought and work that brings us to this evening. Next Sunday, December 1st, is World AIDS Day, an opportunity to increase awareness of the continued impact of HIV and AIDS and to visit a topic that does not get enough attention today as if it no longer affects lives. As you entered the room, I hope you saw the cases that CBH archivist Alice Griffin curated for us tonight. They'll be moved upstairs as a pop-up exhibition for the month of December. As many of you may know, the Center for Brooklyn History holds the most extensive collection of Brooklyn-related materials in the world. And we are a destination for anyone and everyone looking into Brooklyn's past. So the cases display just a sampling of the items that we hold related to the AIDS epidemic that were collected over 30 years ago by the then Brooklyn Historical Society with the intent that people in the future, us, and that feels unfathomable to me and anybody else that was here 30 years ago and lived through the 80s and 90s, can learn, reflect, remember, research, and gain perspective on those early times of the crisis. These cases bring, back, bring us back to that, that first decade of the virus, the stigmas, the resolve, the activism, and, and this institution's role. It was a visionary act of public history. And today, we continue to collect with the future us's in mind. Later, Alice will tell you more about the BHS project. <clears throat> For now, I simply want to invite anyone who is curious about this topic or any Brooklyn topic to consider visiting our library upstairs and to get lost in the extraordinary archives we hold. It's a special honor to welcome the president and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library tonight, Linda Johnson, who is a great supporter of all that we're doing with programming at the Center for Brooklyn History. I also want to acknowledge that we're joined by Lexi Mayers, head of the Center for Brooklyn History, and Jakob Orthos, the library's vice president of arts and culture. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Lizzie Ratner, deputy editor at The Nation and lead reporter for the WNYC podcast, Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows. Lizzie, thank you for traveling down this path. Please help me welcome Lizzie Ratner. Thank you so much, Marsha, for that lovely introduction, and thank you for hosting this event tonight. Thank you to the whole Center for Brooklyn History. You all do some of the best programming out there, and it is always a thrill and an honor to do a panel here, so thank you. I also need to give a big shout out to Linda Johnson, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, and a person that I have the privilege and honor to call my family. So I love you, Linda. I'm just gonna give that shout out here. Also, big shout out to the uh, executive producer, um, Emily Botin. Sorry, Emily, I'm calling you out, of Blind Spot, Plague in the Shadows. Um, Emily is an absolute legend, and it's great to have you here tonight. Two more thank yous, and then I'll be done with the thank yous. I want to thank the staff of the Center for Brooklyn History for staying late here tonight to make sure that we can have this discussion. So thank you all to the staff. And finally, thank you all audience for coming out on this crisp, blustery evening to have this discussion with us. I wanna begin by actually asking all of you a question. I'm not gonna do anything embarrassing like ask anyone to come up here and participate, but just a show of hands would be really great. How many people in this room were here in New York City during the height of the AIDS crisis? 
That would be like 1981 to the late 90s. All right, I see a decent show of hands. Um, not all of you, but a good number of you. And how many of you remember that period in a vivid way? Yeah, okay, a lot of hands, that's, that's excellent. Um, I was here then too, I was very young. I mean, really, really young, because I'm still really, really young. Um, I wasn't that young, actually, but, um, but I was here, I grew up here, I was here in the early 1980s, and I thought I remembered the HIV and AIDS crisis. I thought I understood it. I remember sitting at my family's table and hearing probably around 1983 about this mystery illness that was making gay men really, really sick. I remember hearing the news around 1984 that doctors had discovered this virus that actually was causing this mystery illness. We now know that that virus is HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. I remember hearing about so many men who were dying, lives that were being torn apart. I remember not understanding entirely how HIV was communicated, thinking that it was communicated just by touch and being freaked out. I'm embarrassed to say that. Um, I remember lots of safe sex classes. And then somewhere in the mid-late 90s, I remember hearing about this treatment, this miracle treatment that had rendered this nightmare over, mostly. People were being cured, or not cured, at least, you know, the, the illness was being treated and basically HIV wasn't a problem anymore. And that's kind of the narrative that I had. Um, and then I started working on this podcast called Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows, and I learned a very, very different story about HIV and AIDS, one that is much more fundamental to this city, to who the city is, to who it was, to what we've become today. Um, and it is that story that we're gonna be sharing with all of you tonight. So to help introduce this story, I'm gonna actually play a clip, or we're gonna play a clip, I'm not gonna press play, I don't think myself, but we're gonna play a clip from Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows. And it's a clip of this woman, Valerie Reyes Jimenez, who is a remarkable HIV activist and advocate. And she grew up in the Lower East Side or Alphabet City, New York, um, and in the late 1970s and 80s, that neighborhood was struck by two crises. The first crisis was joblessness and economic crisis. The second crisis was heroin. And from these two crisis, crises came a third crisis that we're gonna hear about now uh, when we played this clip, which was in some ways a defining moment for me when I had this conversation with her. So roll the clip. People just started like disappearing. Like one day they were there and the next day they were gone. These 20 people that used to hang out in this building shooting up, they're all gone. You know, like car wash, papo, tearso, you know, cocoi. You know, like all these people, they're all gone. Like where did they go? It was pretty, pretty insane, you know, and um, a lot of people died, a lot. Like when you say a lot, Can you give me, you know, how many people off the top of your head do you think you knew at that point who had died? At least 75 people from the block alone. I was not expecting that. Yeah, at least 75 people from the block alone. In about maybe a period of eight to 10 years, So I've heard that clip a lot of times, and it never fails to floor me. Um, And on that sort of very heavy note, I'm going to bring on our panelists who are going to help explain how that crisis happened, how it happened that 75 people on a single block disappeared over the course of five to 10 years. So I'm going to migrate over to a chair and then introduce our panelists. All right, can you hear me as well with this mic? Excellent. All right, so I'm gonna bring on first the wonderful Michelle Lopez. Come on up, Michelle. (laughs) Michelle Lopez is a force of nature. She is an activist, an advocate, a mother, a grandmother. Her resume is far too long for me to read. 
So I'm just going to put it this way, um, that Michelle has, whoops, so sorry, has worked to represent the needs of people living with HIV since the 1990s. She's currently a consultant with the Center for AIDS Research and a community educator for Merck and is also doing about 20 other things. But we will hear a lot more about what you're doing during the course of the discussion. All right, I'd love to bring up Johnny Guailupo now. Um, Johnny has worked as an HIV activist and advocate for the last two decades. He's currently the Assistant Program Director for Housing Works Youth and Prevention Services, a program that he literally created in 2011. He's also a research assistant with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and like Michelle, his resume goes on and on and on, well beyond that, but I will stop there for tonight. And then finally, we have Dr. Andy Wisnia. Andy is the director of the Division of Allergy and Immunology and Family-Based HIV Services at Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx. He has almost 40 years of experience as an HIV provider and researcher. He's also a professor of pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited to be talking with you tonight. So at the beginning, I shared just a few moments ago my many sort of misunderstandings of the HIV crisis. And I think while my misunderstandings persisted a lot longer than others, there was in general a lot of confusion and misunderstanding during the early days. Uh, we know with COVID that at the beginning of a crisis, people don't really know what's going on. It takes a while to find out. In the case of HIV and AIDS, that it didn't just take though like six months eight months, it was years. So I want to just set the scene here a little bit um, by asking all of you how you understood HIV and AIDS, what you knew about it before it intersected with your lives. Why don't we start with you, Michelle? I first um, learned and heard about HIV. Originally, I'm from the Caribbean, a beautiful island called Trinidad. And um, I was in high school. And my mom came home very sad and saying, my favorite cousin died in America. This was 1982. He died in America, and he died from that cancer that was killing gay men. So back then I was, as I said, in high school, and we hear, you know, heard about it. He came home, he had a funeral, we didn't, AIDS was not even a word. Mm. Yeah, that right. That I even recognize. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't until um, right 1984 that there was a diagnosis. Um, there, there was an actual virus, and for years, those early years, it was really sort of deemed and stigmatized an illness yes. of gay men, of gay men. Um, and it was known as the gay cancer. Yes. And so, That's Johnny, right. how about you? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, so. Uh, I was born in 1981, so I remember around 1988, um, my uncle passed away of HIV, or uh, AIDS, complications of AIDS in 1993, so I just remember the stigma that as a young child, I would just, just experience in the South Bronx, um, and that was my first encounter with, with AIDS. So both of you had these people who were incredibly co close yeah. to you who were just disappearing yeah, of this yeah, illness. No wanted to get in the elevator. No one wanted to play around yes. with me and my uncle. I had no idea. I couldn't understand. Yeah. yeah. And the stigma also. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Andy, what about you? You were already in medical school? It, it is on. <laughs> it's on already. Okay. Um, I actually sort of learned over time. So I was a medical student in Columbia. I was in a... Uh, rotation, medicine rotation at Harlem, and there were a number of patients who were admitted, and they had multiple infections, unusual infections, they just weren't getting better, and people started talking about maybe it was something in the drugs, maybe it was something in something else, and we didn't know what was happening. And then um, I then went on to do my residency in pediatrics at Jacoby in the Bronx, which is a municipal hospital, and we had all these little babies there who were getting admitted to the hospital, and they had typical pediatric illnesses, diarrhea, respiratory things, but they never really got better. As they started getting better, and you say, great, they're gonna go home tomorrow, all of a sudden, that night they would get diarrhea, and they would have 
that read that required hyperalimentation. And you're sitting there saying, I don't know what's going on. And people started talking about maybe it's this, and people were even questioning whether it was the formulas mm -hmm. that were going on. And then over the next couple of years, I remember a medical student that was a senior resident, and with she, she said, you know, there's this article in the New England Journal, and it sounds like these babies are, are acting like they have immunodeficiency. And maybe what we're seeing in kids, and I think we were talking about it in the background, but she just asked that question. She said, I think this may be it. And we said, oh. And um, didn't have a name. It took a while from, uh, you know, there was, you know, GRID, and there were all these names that happened with HIV. And GRID stands for gay-related yeah. immunodeficiency. Yeah. So again, there's this sort of insistence at the beginning that this was a quote-unquote gay illness. Right. So, and, so, and, and why did it have immunodeficiencies? And then we started talking about pediatrics. And as people started raising it, the question was, no, it can't happen in kids because they must just have an inborn error in their, in their immune system because that's what we see in immunology. And it doesn't fit this, it doesn't fit that. Um, and then over the years, it evolved. And I, I just the last one, I, I, I'm an immunologist. I'm an allergist immunologist. That's because I had terrible allergies. I grew up in Queens. I was an allergic mess. I decided after do a fellowship in allergy, allergy and immunology. And my allergy immunology fellowship was an HIV fellowship because we had about 67 children at Einstein that we were following who had HIV, who were able to make it over to Einstein. That didn't include the South Bronx where there were no services, but these were people who were, who were able to come in. And the day I walked in, they said, here, you're everything. You're the social worker. You're everything to these patients. Um, so, so, and I'm so sorry. I want to pause you there, actually, because I want to now sort of take us through the epidemic, um, which really is considered, as I said, to have lasted from like 1981 at its most crisis levels to about 1998, 2000, we'll say. But you all might correct me here because in some ways it's still ongoing. But so I want to start with you, Andy. Um, and you hit on two things when you were just talking, um, two things that I think would have been surprising back in the day or were surprising. Um, one is that when people think about the epicenter, of HIV and AIDS in New York City, when pe not people, but sort of when the social history often gets told, the popular history, they don't necessarily, some people don't think of the Bronx or the South Bronx as an epicenter. You're telling us here that the South Bronx was an epicenter. Also, children are not often associated in the popular mind or memory with HIV and AIDS, and yet that was your focus. So can you tell me a little bit about, um, first, what you were, you told us about the children. Um, tell us sort of when you started, when you realized this was HIV, when it was finally recognized, what was it like on the hospital ward treating these children? So let's start with that actually. What did you see? Okay. Um, so A, we try to keep them out of the hospital. Okay. Yes. So that's always in the world of pediatrics. But they were, you know, the, there were classic clinical symptoms that you saw. Um, so the big lymph nodes, kids having recurrent infections, and it actually got to the point where um, it was very interesting. The nurses in the emergency rooms were calling us and saying, hey, there's another new patient for you here, because they were putting the symptoms together. Um, and, and what year hospital, was this roughly? Sorry, just... This was 86, okay. 85, 86. So pretty deep into the crisis. Yes, yeah, this is, and we knew that, by then we knew that it was a virus mm -hmm. because we had a diagnostic test the first couple of years with symptoms. So you didn't even have, you couldn't test, you couldn't monitor how severe the virus is. All you could do is look at the immune system and say, okay, this is getting worse. Um, as far as hospitalizations, there were, there were the sick children, and then there were the children who were uh, border babies. Mm. There were a lot, a lot, a lot of border babies. There were children born to infected moms. Initially, a lot of the moms were uh, intravenous drug addicts. Many of them had died. Um, and they ended up in this, in this free fall. They're like, where do they go? Mm. And they, went, they ended up in the hospital. So there were children who, who lived in hospitals for two years. Um, and um, 
It was interesting to watch because at the very beginning, people were afraid to touch these babies. And then as the medical students came through and, and, and the residents came, you know, we'd walk around on rounds with them. And, I'd, and so if I asked the question, no one answered, I'd ask the kid. I said, what do you think of this? You know, um, And they sort of became part of the hospital floor. And it was like a family. Um, and I can tell you that one of the stories is that one of our nurses fell in love with one of these four border babies and wanted to adopt the child, but the father didn't relinquish rights, so the child was stuck in the hospital, and she was just tormented, wanted to, so she married him. She married him so that she can adopt the baby. I remember you okay? telling me, yeah. And it's incredible, right? So, Andy, I sort of cut myself off, actually, with the first question I was going to ask you, which is, um, you know, people don't think of the Bronx, or some people don't think of the Bronx as an epicenter um, for the HIV and AIDS virus. Um, what was going on? You know, why were you seeing so many of these children? Um, just for one little bit of background here that's shocking, um, in 1988, there was a study of the South Bronx that showed that men between the ages of, I think, 25 and 44, um, that there was an estimated, so HIV rate among men in the South Bronx between those ages of about 10 to 21 percent. Now that's a big spread, but it's still a shocking spread. And I think around that time I saw that a hospital, maybe it was Lincoln, um, that five out of 10 women delivering were HIV positive. That, you know, and so I'm wondering why, what was going on? Well, I don't think epidemics pick up out of nowhere. Okay, so there's always this, there's a, I think there was poverty. New York City was sort of uh, bankrupt in the late 70s. Um, so services weren't there. There was a lot of drugs, then different drugs. Okay, so there was uh, angel dust at the time and, um, and speed balls, which were cocaine and heroin. Um, and there's a lot of intravenous drug use and sharing needles. There were no needle sharing things. Um, there was poor people and people selling sex for money, um, and that this was just brewing. And it was in, a, in the neighborhoods that, were, that had the least resources and the greatest poverty. So it was Harlem, the Bronx, Newark, New Jersey is one of the hot bites. And when you look nationally, um, where the pediatric HIV programs, most of them started, they were in similar neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. So Michelle, I want to turn to you now. Um, you know, we're talking about ways in which our understanding of the virus, um, or my understanding certainly, and a lot of the pub public popular understanding didn't match reality. Yeah. So one of the ideas out there was that women didn't get HIV and AIDS. Um, in fact, um, it took until 1993 for the Center for Disease Control to update the definition of AIDS to include symptoms that many women experienced. So you had this weird situation where women were literally dying of this disease they couldn't actually get diagnosed for. So, all right, so I wanna ask you, um, your story kind of flies in the face of all of these oh myths. <laughs> so, uh, so tell me about, tell me your story, beginning with that trip you took one day on a subway uh, in the early 90s in New York City. That subway ride that I always tend to, you know, use within the platform of me bringing this story, I got tested for the virus and also too, my daughter was nine months old at the time as a newborn baby because of a domestic violence situation. Back then I was, what, 22 when I met her dad, and by the age of 23, had this beautiful baby girl, but um, I was not with her dad at the time, her being a newborn baby. The person that I was with was someone, you know, and there are some intersection of some realities of what comes into play on, you know, it's like that song, you know, how did you get here? Nobody's supposed to be here. How did HIV get here in Michelle's life? I was a young immigrant girl believing 
every man that said to me, I'm going to marry you, and you're going to get your green card, and you're going to be all right. I never got the green card. I got HIV. Okay? This was the reality within many of that intersection of the, the substance use and the homelessness. DV, domestic violence, became a component in many of the immigrant women or young girls. And when I met her dad, um, I was the mom of a young kid. I had a son. That little boy was stigmatized. I, I learned and heard these words because at the time, my son was born January the 1st, 1987. This was the year that Haitians was being, you know, ostracized for, and, you know, saying that, you know, they were bringing AIDS to the, you know, to the yeah. United States and they were spreading HIV. His dad was a Haitian man. And I remember the doctors and they, I heard the discussion when this kid was born, we have to test this baby because we just found out his dad is a Haitian man. And I remember having this baby wrapped, walking over the Brooklyn Bridge with a group of Haitian people. I'm not Haitian, I'm Trinidadian and Venezuela. <laughs> you know, that's my heritage. So here I am now, because of this domestic violence situation, it was the worst beating that I got from my batterer that night, but it was the best, because I left. Wrapped that nine-month-old baby in a blanket. I, was, I remember being bloodied, beat up, and I started riding the trains. I left, I started out, my journey started out from Cambria Heights in Queens. And back then, we, you know, we would get into these gypsy vans called the Dulla Vans. And I remember getting into a Dulla van and I'm telling the man, I have to leave, I gotta leave. And he's seeing me looking all beat up and black. He said, where you wanna go? Where you wanna go? I got on the trains and I started riding the trains from out there. And the last train that I ended up on, it was morning time. Because I remember asking a woman who came on the train, she was, you know, looked really nice. And I said, miss, excuse me, what time it is? And she said, ooh. She says, honey, it's rush hour. And as she said those words to me, I looked up and there was an ad on that train. And that ad, that ad spoke to me. The ad said, if you're a woman, if you're an immigrant, if you're dealing with substance use issues, if you're dealing with domestic violence, the ad was just going down and I was just in my head, checklist, checklist, checklist. I got off the train. And when I got off the train, I called the number. The number that was listed there, and <laughs> to this day I talk about it. I'm not a religious person. I'm very spiritual. And that spirit <laughs> moved me to where, called the number, a voice answered, and I just poured my heart. I just, I shared everything that went on in my life to this person. And that person was there just listening to me. And at a final point, she said, where are you right now? I said, I'm in the streets, I'm in Brooklyn. And she said, what part? She said, look around, look for the street names. And I was standing at the corner of Flatbush Avenue and Nevin Street. And when I called out that intersection, the woman gasped. She said, <gasps> and I said, oh my God, miss, did I say something wrong? And she said, no. She said, I want you to turn around and face east, and I want you to walk five blocks, and you're gonna find me. The woman was at an organization at the time called CFPC, Community Family Planning Council. That agency is now called CHN, Community Healthcare Network. And I was patient number one because by the time I got there to the clinic, there was a group of people there waiting for me. And as I walked in, they said, would you like to see the doctor? There's a doctor here, he's willing to see you. We would like to test you for HIV. And I looked and I said, what, test me, what? I said, no. I said, women don't get HIV. And the doctor that was there he looked at me and he said, I'm so sorry. 
But yes, yes, you all do get HIV. Mm -hmm. And the things that you shared with us that is going on with you, we would like to test you and this baby. That same day I had to be treated for gonorrhea. Mm -hmm. That same day I was placed in a shelter. And back then we did not have the rapid test. I was placed in a, in a shelter for battered women with my baby and I had to remain two weeks. Two weeks of <laughs> thinking possibly everything that that counselor discussed with me because she helped me to understand why my test and the baby's test may come back positive. It was not until <sighs> I got my results, yes, and I was told within that two week period, unfortunately, Ms. Lopez, you and your baby tested positive. But we are not sure if your baby is actually right. infected. That's the words that was used to us. Today I correct people like Dr. Wisden. I said, don't you say I'm infected. <laughs> I am living with a virus called HIV. We have come this far. So, Michelle, I have a thousand more questions for you, yeah. and I, I'm, I'm going to ask one more right now, mm -hmm. but I want to just kind of keep listening to you forever, I have to say. Um, I'm a storyteller. Yeah, no, I've I know. I've had a few do. conversations with Michelle, and I can honestly just keep sitting here each mm -hmm. time, each time. Um, yeah, yeah, you tell the powerful stories. But so I've... One more question, I'm gonna be restrained and just ask one, which is, you get this horrible diagnosis. You are homeless at this point. You are living yeah. in a shelter. You are an immigrant wom woman. Mm -hmm. And yet here you are today. Oh. And so, you know, I happen to know from having talked to you that um, connecting with a bunch of activists My God. really changed your life. So can you tell us just like super quickly how you ended up connecting with a certain set of activists and how that changed things for you? The same organization that tested me, placed me in a shelter because of this funded grant that they got. I was provided with case management services right away and <laughs> how things happen in life. My daughter, I was told by my case manager, we are not really sure if your daughter is, you know, is, mm -hmm. you know, is infected with HIV. But one of the things we want you to know is that a lot of women is dying from this disease. That was the case manager. She said that there's a group called Act Up New York. And they're looking for women who are living with the virus because they need someone to go and testify at the Food and Drug Administration. This was now 1991. Right, and this was all about the sort of failure to have AIDS diagnosis contained yes. symptoms experienced women were by dying women. from AIDS. Women, myself and another woman, I'm not breaking confidentiality because Phyllis have moved on, she's up there in the heavens. And myself and this other woman by the name of Phyllis Sharp, we went down to the FDA. Raven was a baby. And I stood up at the FDA, and when I spoke to them, I spoke to them, and I could not believe the words. Mm. Because I found community when I found ACT UP. ACT UP did not look at me as, this is this immigrant girl, this is this black girl. ACT UP looked at me as a woman with a baby, and I remember these gay guys saying, honey, we don't know what you are gonna do, because nobody knew this was gonna happen to you guys. I remember these words, on the floor of ACT UP. So when I was asked, you know, I, I swear at one point in time I felt like a goddamn congressperson. I was like, shit, I gotta represent my community. We <laughs> went before, act, before the FDA and we testified and we helped them understand yeah. why it was possible. You all have to give us a diagnosis. We are dying from AIDS. And some of us were not even diagnosed. Exactly. So we helped them understand what this was about. But I have to say it again. I had some of the best mentors <laughs> that a woman newly diagnosed with the virus and a baby had because it got me to the point where there was a, a, an assembly woman. She sued the state of New York because they were blindly testing our children, our newborn babies. And they knew who was going home with the virus. They were not 
confirming at that point, we had to wait until our children were 18 months to two years. So to clarify, they were testing kids, but not then telling but the women. But not telling the that, women. That they were HIV positive and here in New Assemblywoman yeah. Nettie Myerson sued the state of New York. And you know what, I gotta say it today. Today, if I see Nettie Myerson right now, I would tell her thank you. Because we went up against myself and some other women. Because Nettie Myerson said, oh, those mothers, they're going out there, they're using drugs, they're doing alcohol, they're sleeping around with everybody. She said, I want to save the babies. She got the state to unblind those tests and to let the mothers know because at a newborn baby's, a newborn child, you are definitely seeing the mom's immune system. A child, right. a person develops their own immune system between the age 18 months to two years. So I want to pause you there. Just to say, because there's a lot more to say here, um, and just acknowledge that the fight you had to sort of change the definition of HIV, of AIDS, for was successful. And now I want to bring in, and it changed everything for generations that followed. But I want to bring you in, Johnny. Yes, yes. And I want to hear a little bit about, or a lot about, your story. You know, you had this uncle, and that was your first experience um, of, of AIDS. Um, and it was sounds like a traumatic one. You know, people didn't want to get in the elevator with you um, because of this uncle of yours. And then at some point, you yourself found out that you had this virus. Can you tell us a little bit about the story about how you found out and what happened next to you? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm from the South Bronx um, and uh, Grew up sheltered with my grandparents. Both of my parents were addicted to heroin and crack in the 1980s, early 90s. So, you know, everything was in front of my face. Everything that's being spoken about uh, that Andy and Michelle mentioned, I've witnessed from a young age. Um, when I started high school in St. Raymond's uh, Catholic School in Castle Hill, that was the first time I was, like, going outside of my... The, the safe zone, which was like 138th Street and 3rd Avenue, that area in South Bronx. Um, and I knew I was gay by then, um, but I just didn't have the community or the resources or even knew about like where to access resources or at least like assistance or like guidance, mentorship. Um, so during high school, I did meet um, some folks. I was introduced to the village, the West Village, Christopher Street. I was 15 years old, already hanging out, um, sexually active, not knowing what I was getting myself into. All I knew about HIV or AIDS was that it was just something that my grandmother was going through because my uncle passed away in 1993. Um, and mm -hmm. so there, at this point, like that's mid, late 90s, mid 90s, but there wasn't really education. We yeah, no education. I informed the brother in school um, that I was gay. Um, but I was not getting the type of counseling it, that a young person that is telling someone that they're gay should receive, which is like sexual health education and, you know, protection and what's, um, you know, HIV and AIDS, STDs, STIs. So in 1998, I was uh, taken to the emergency room, Our Lady of Mercy, which is now Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. And I went in because I was having a lot of pains in my stomach. So I went with my grandmother, who was my guardian then. Um, they did some tests. They asked me some questions. Two weeks later, I had to go back um, for the results. At that time, they told my grandmother she had to go outside. I was in an empty room with just one desk and three chairs. Doctor came, a social worker came. I was sitting there. Um, just nervous, shy, and afraid, not knowing what was happening. I was told that I had a sexually transmitted infection um, and that I was HIV positive. Um, and they gave me a follow-up card. I was 17 years old at that time. Um, I was lost. And I had to then confront my grandmother, who was at that time not sure what was going on. It's the first time that she's being told to go outside while I was being asked questions of a follow -up, medical follow-up. Um, so since then, um, I just had to just just take things on my own, deal with some of the challenges. I already saw the stigma that was uh, associated with HIV and AIDS 
from when I was young, so I was scared to tell my family or my grandmother at all that it was just something that they just wanted to make sure that I was understood like the stomach virus that I had. Um, I was connected to Montefiore Hospital Adolescent AIDS Program um, in 1998, and it took me some time to go inside because again, I was scared. I was shameful of just like, just feeling this shame of like what I was potentially going to be um, just experiencing based on like the stigma that was already around in my community, um, but also in the community where I grew up at. Um, I met some amazing people, Dr. Futterman, who was running the Adolescent AIDS Program at Montefiore Hospital, um, an amazing nurse practitioner that pretty much like just was like my second mom, um, uh, Addis Myerson, who is no longer with us, but she took care of me, and she's such a beautiful person. And from there, um, you know, I went through its challenges, experiences. I had to learn what I was going through, um, and I was in a quest to look for community at that time. Yeah, I mean, when you, you know, it's interesting, from the experience of, of doing Blind Spot, it seems like, um, two sort of themes emerge. One is that a lot of the doctors and the activists had to, had to kind of build the airplane while flying it. Mm -hmm. um, you all had to build this infrastructure of support that the government wasn't providing, but also that community was absolutely fundamental to people's survival. Mm -hmm. So can you just talk very briefly, and I'm sorry to rough, rush you yeah. on this, about sort of when you actually became an activist and an advocate, what did you do and how did that change things for you? Yes, so I remember I was doing peer education at the Adolescent AIDS program and doing outreach and educating um, just community members in the South Bronx about HIV and promoting HIV testing. But I was so curious and I remember reading Paws Magazine in 2004, around April, and I remember seeing um, the article of uh, Keith Kyler. Keith one Kyler. of the founders yeah. of Housing Works. And it was talking about Keith Kyler's um, passing. And that's when I found out about Housing Works. And I went to a conference, a Brian White National Youth Conference. And it happened in Nashville, Tennessee at that time. And they were recruiting young people to become activists in their own community. And I was like, wow, this is something that I want to do. Um, I applied. I was um, taken to D.C. for this like boot camp training where I met amazing activists that were like in the forefront. Um, and from there, I joined Act Up New York. I was a part of amazing groups, also Act Up Philly. Um, and um, yeah, in 2005, I joined Housing Works, and I've been working with Housing Works since then. Um, and I've gotten arrested many times for really like just issues that are concerning my community um, and just the community in general. I'm gonna pause for one second to do a quick time check with Marsha um, because we have a, another component of the program. Five minutes, perfect, okay. Yikes, um, I have so many more questions. So, well, I'm gonna um, try to bring Andy and Michelle together for something. So we have this idea that around 1996, these incredible drugs are introduced, protease inhibitors, and they act like miracles. Um, they end up not curing HIV, but sending it into a kind of remission. Is that fair to say, Andy? We all were calling it the Lazarus Syndrome. The Lazarus there was Syndrome. Articles. Yeah. There was news flash. There, oh my goodness! It right. Was, it and was just the. It was the hot topic. There's these medications that's bringing these people back to life. And yet, so and yet, it wasn't bringing everybody back to life. It wasn't getting into every community. So I want to ask you, Andy, really quickly, and then I think you're going to maybe, if you can bring in Michelle, or you just hop in, um, you know, for children in particular, and not only children, but sort of other people in the South Bronx, were they getting these drugs right away, these miracle drugs? Yeah, so... Um I think that my first comment is, I think we learned tremendous amount of getting drugs developed for children that have passed on into the current and it's actually shaped the way that development of HIV drugs happen, that, that development of drugs for, for children's happened. So um, 
when, when these drugs were coming along, we're watching, I actually was involved in one of the adult trials, the initial AZT placebo trial, trial, and we're still seeing these kids and we're saying, what's going on here? Why don't we do that? And early on, being an immunologist and now taking care of children and having gone to, I was probably going to a funeral every, other, every three weeks of our patients, and now you have to get up and say, what am I gonna do? I just can't care for this, and I, I'm giving hope, but we need to do something. I'm from Queens, you need to do something. So, I, um, so we, a group of us got very, very active. So whenever the drug, drug companies were having advisories, and about how do, we, how do we position these drugs for treating adults, we showed up at the meetings. And then even question and answer and say, okay, where are you with pediatrics? And they go, oh, I don't know, it's, you know, it's not much of a market, is there a market? Yes, there's an important market, and this, this advocacy really happened. And we actually pushed the drug companies reluctantly to do this. And then when you're pushing, it's not like, okay, Here's a pill for an adult. How do I get into a four-year-old? So you had to start developing pediatric-specific formulations. Or if there's a drug, and I, we, we actually had pill-swallowing clinics at our hospital because we had to teach six-year-olds to swallow very large tablets because that was all that was available. And then, so I'm yeah, just like going to go there. You. Anyway, so we were involved in from the, 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 the protease inhibitor was no finner. We were, we were the phase one, two site in New York and, Ray, and uh, Michelle's daughter was enrolled in this trial. And it was really, what's the dose and what's the toxicity? We must never, and I would never ever forget this, Raven Lopez was the child that a pharmaceutical company called Agaron in order for a drug to get the the right dose, and they must get the safe pharmacokinetic dosage of this formulary of protease inhibitors. The company who wanted to do it spoke to Dr. Wisney and some other of the pediatricians, and they said, can you ask one of the moms or fathers that have these children, we need to have, the kid will have to be doing a 24-hour procedure and we would have to give them different levels of the dosage. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that could have been death. Dr. Wisnia spoke to myself and some other moms, and I said, yes, I'm going to do it. Raven, could you stand up, please, baby? She's 34. She's 34. Myself, this doctor... And a team of researchers from a company called Agaron Pharmaceutical made it possible that children had a safe dosage of the first protease that was available for children called Virusep. Can I? <laughs> Go yeah, right ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, Go right ahead. To be ahead. really clear, so, so you got it. Andy I'm, Wisnia tell is Raven and Michelle's doctor. So just to be super so, clear there. Yeah. That was Raven's. Yeah. I, they got old, I didn't. Um, so the, so Raven's on this trial, and as part of trial, we were able to get access to whether or not there was virus in the blood or not. So on a Friday afternoon, I call Michelle up, and she's at an ACT UP meeting. <laughs> okay. I said, what's all the noise? I'm an ACT UP meeting. She, she said, I said, okay, I have a Raven's Results, she says, what, what is it? I said, we're going to call a misundetectable, which meant no detectable virus. Undetectable. And I said that, and the next thing I hear is shrieking, <laughs> yelling at this meeting. And Michelle's like, Wait, da, da, da. <laughs> and it was like a moment where you it sat. It was the best, one of the best moments. She was the first one. Yes, one of the best moments in our lives. But we did yeah. that. You we did that. Did no, that. Yeah. you did it. And to be did really it. clear, this happened, this major breakthrough happened yes. at a hospital in the South Bronx, the South Bronx. Um, you yes. know, to the daughter of Michelle and to Michelle. And, you know, but for the activism and bravery mm -hmm. and the determination of doctors like Andy Wisnia, this wouldn't have happened. And it happened after years when the government <laughs> really didn't do enough and when there was a lot of stigma and people wanted to turn away from this illness 
And people, like our three panelists here, said, no, you're not going to turn away from us. I trusted so, this man. Yeah. I trusted this. And I can say that, you know, there's the other part of our family. When I told them what it is that what we was going to do, I remember my family. I remember my mom, that little Caribbean woman. Michelle, what does this man know about these drugs? The baby going to die. That was my mom. And I said to her, Mom, you forgot something that you, you've been saying to us. Have faith. I said, that man, he didn't lie to me. He did not give me false hope. He says, Michelle, trust me. I'm going to make sure. I'm going to make sure that every dose that she gets is safe for her. And look at her today. I love him. We have no idea how much I love him. I really, really do. I do. My grandson is here. And I said to my grandson, I said, you got to meet your mommy's doctor. He took care of your mommy. Because of him, your mommy is still, you know. And he haven't connected the gist of it, but he, he has already had a visit with Dr. Andrew Wisner because he's asthmatic. And what is his specialty? He's <laughs> okay. So I said to him, I said, you better find Andy. He's the only person that's going to know what to do with this asthma. <laughs> you know, but he's still in our lives. I hate to be the person interrupting this moment, but I will just say, um, you know, this is a part of our history that we should all know. Yeah. And, and we don't. Um, and here's my indelicate pivot, but it is my pivot. Um, the Center for Brooklyn History, um, back when it was the Brooklyn Historical Society, was aware that history was being made and that it would likely be forgotten. And so back in the 1990s, they pulled together a groundbreaking oral history and ex exhibit project or exhibition project um, under the leadership of then director David Kahn and it is a remarkable history that's been preserved, and we're gonna hear about it now. Um, and we're gonna hear about it from Alice Griffin. And basically, just as we began this evening by listening, we're gonna end it by listening to some powerful, um, some powerful, uh, why am I blanking on the word, but some powerful testaments from that era. Um, to what was going on. So Alice, take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Michelle, Johnny, and Andy. Um, it's, it's actually really amazing to be able to present these materials alongside this discussion. So this is um, really special to be here tonight. Um, so you've gotten a little background on the project through which these oral histories were recorded. In 1991, the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is uh, the predecessor to the Center for Brooklyn History, where we are today, embarked on a project to collect the material culture of people affected by HIV and AIDS in Brooklyn. The executive director at the time, David Kahn, had a, a partner who had died of AIDS and he wanted to preserve this material so that future generations would know what the, um, uh, what the HIV AIDS crisis of the 80s and 90s was like. Um, the, um, as Lizzie said, it included an exhibition and an oral history component. Um, oral histories were recorded with uh, people with HIV and AIDS, family members, uh, community advocates. And it opened in 1993. The objects that were donated as a part of it are now a part of what is called the AIDS Brooklyn Exhibition Collection, which anyone can look at. You just go upstairs and request. Um, generally, we like you to make an appointment first. Um, and so I'm going to play a video, um, a few clips strung together from a walkthrough of the exhibition um, and with the project director, Robert Rosenberg. Um, and this is a part of the Brooklyn Historical Society Institutional Records, um, which is, is currently being processed, but will also be available. <laughs> um, so in this, we want to play this video because it sets the tone for the exhibition. Um, it tells you why it was important and um, why Brooklyn was uniquely affected by the pandemic. So I do just want to say that there is... Um, 
the it was closed captioned for this event um, by AI. Sorry, so there's a little. Um, it's pretty good, but it's uh, some words got a little lost. Hi, I'm Robert Rosenberg, and I'm the guest curator for the AIDS Brooklyn exhibit behind me. And I'm gonna we're making this tape to show to people who work here, who come on staff on uh, the next few months to learn more about the exhibit and to talk a little bit about different kinds of issues that may come up for people working here with this exhibit here. Um, we're going to go on a little tour today of the different areas of the exhibit and talk about the way in which it was produced um, and the reasons behind different aspects of the exhibit. But before I, we do that, I just want to talk a little bit about some unique and special issues around um, the AIDS Brooklyn exhibit itself. Okay, another important thing about AIDS Brooklyn as an exhibit is that it's kind of unique for a history museum to be doing an exhibit on a contemporary subject like this, which still has a lot of controversy and difficult feelings surrounding it. And especially because of AIDS, which deals with issues of sexuality and drug use, a lot of people, there's a lot of issues of morality, people's questions about how explicit to be, not how, how explicit you shouldn't be. And some people may come in here and have difficulties with what we've done in the exhibit. One thing is that anybody working in visitor services or anybody who answers the phone talking about the exhibit should always make clear that we think the exhibit is really intended either for adults or for teenagers accompanied by a parent, a teacher, whatever. And it's not really intended for younger children, though you might choose to bring your child to it. That way we can avoid people coming here with little kids and going into the exhibit by accident. So everyone should be told that when they walk into the museum to begin with. And the other thing is is to figure out how you might handle the issue if somebody comes up to you, you're working at the visitor services desk or in the building and says, I was very upset because I saw something in there that shouldn't have been in the museum or my child saw. And basically, you should be willing to listen to the person, hear them out, and then again, make clear to them what our policy or thinking about the whole exhibit is and why it's there, which we'll get into more later. But basically, the idea that it's important to talk about these issues in a direct and honest way that helps to educate the public and that's the best way to combat the AIDS epidemic. Um, the other thing is that the exhibit itself might be upsetting in an emotional way to people. People might come here and think about people they've lost, they themselves might be sick and it might bring up a lot of feelings and so already a number of times people have been crying because they were upset about things that they saw and just remember this is not a simple exhibit about Brooklyn's past but something that might be very close and touch people's lives in very direct ways today. So. Um, to be sensitive to that and to be open to when people might come and want to be talking about those kinds of things. Um, basically, we interviewed around 23 people for the exhibit, um, around half of them because they were had AIDS or they were people who were HIV positive, all in Brooklyn, and the other half because they were involved or affected by the crisis in some ways. They were a mother, a husband, a lover, somebody who had passed away who was currently sick. They were involved in the community as a community worker, as a volunteer, as a political activist, as a health care provider um, with the AIDS crisis, and some of those people themselves are positive, but they were interviewed because of the role they played in the community. So we try to get a diverse cross-section of people, all different races, ethnic backgrounds, straight and gay, women and men, who have been affected by AIDS in some way or another in Brooklyn. And they form the spine, the core of the exhibit. And about 80% of the objects that you see throughout the exhibit are donated or loaned by these people. Another around 20% of the objects are donated or loaned by other people in Brooklyn. And this area over here is called AIDS is a Neighborhood Issue. And it focuses on the way that AIDS has affected different neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And we use this kind of prop here of this stair, which gives a sense of a row house or a brownstone kind of stair um, that's very common in Brooklyn. And um, it's not to be walked on. It's a little sign for kids to not walk on it. And um, this area also focuses especially on the issue of IV drug use or in injection drug use and AIDS because people who have been injecting drugs with needles are one of the most uh, highly affected groups by AIDS and especially in Brooklyn that's a very big issue so that's where a lot of that is dealt with and as you can see we have large photo murals, small photos
photos and over here on this side we have cases with things from different people who were interviewed. You have the pictures of the people again, quotes from them, um, different kinds of objects. Here's a little heart shaped pillow with buttons in them, a book somebody used um, about daily supportive kind of quotes for people with AIDS and the various stories of people's lives. Okay, so um, there's a lot more that could be said. Sorry, I have to X that out looking at the screen. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about the exhibition and these materials. So I do encourage you to look at the exhibit cases. They will be up um, upstairs on the second floor outside of the library through the month of December in recognition of World AIDS Day. And um, we'll be listening to uh, a few oral histories now. And um, that, uh, let me get back to my PowerPoint. Here we go. And uh, oral, the oral histories are also available to listen to anytime on uh, our oral history portal. Okay. So most of the oral histories were conducted by Robert Sember, who is also a, a person on the project staff. And in this first clip from 1992, Dolores Rivera, a woman living with AIDS, described what it felt like to be diagnosed with the disease. Um, I, none of the topics we've been talking about tonight are easy, but I do just want to um, give you all a heads up that she uh, mentioned suicide. When I first heard it, I was devastated again. and. Uh... My first thing was uh, to commit suicide. You know, added the guilt, the shame, the whole thing. And uh, it took a whole year before I even told my family that I had it. Because uh, my daughter had had a friend whose brother had AIDS, and she stopped being friends with them because she didn't want her kids there. Uh, my children were like very ignorant of uh, the AIDS, and they were afraid, I guess. So I was, my fear was that they were rejecting. You know, and so I didn't tell them. It wasn't until I got very sick and I almost died that uh, my doctor spoke to me and told me he thought it was best that I let my kids know what was going on because it wasn't being fair to them. You know, that if I didn't make it, that they would hear it from somebody else. So uh, New Year's of 88, I sat down with them and talked to them. In this, excuse me, in this next clip, I am introducing Phil Coleman, who was also recorded in 1992. Coleman had AIDS and volunteered with the Gay Men's Health Crisis, or GMHC, as you'll see him refer it to by acronym in here. And here he's also discussing his diagnosis. Um, I also wanted to say when he says PCP, that refers to uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. Oops, sorry. I was diagnosed the same time I got sick, which was in January of 89, when I had PCP. Mm -hmm. Because I had, I think I mentioned I had gotten the notion that it had missed me because of all the younger, healthier people dying that I knew, you know, so I figured, oh, I must have missed it. And, you know, as I said, as soon as I got that idea set in my head, PCP popped out, <laughs> you know, and gotcha, you know, and I was, I, was, I was devastated. But because of my knowledge of places to go, you know, I, I and my knowing that I needed, to, needed help, you know, a lot of people are afraid of going for help, you know, they don't, they've never been exposed to the need for that, you know, and so, but I, you know, I knew about all those things, so I just immediately went to, to for instance, GMHC and registered for a therapy group, you know, because I knew I was going to need it because I was going bonkers, you know, my, my, my mind was exploding. And I, I was lucky enough to have had a lot of knowledge. I knew a lot about AIDS, you know, so it wasn't that you know, I didn't know anything about AIDS, but most people don't, you know, and that's, that's the, the, the big problem. 
A common theme throughout these interviews and a theme explored in the exhibition was uh, the amount of time and energy it took to take care of oneself after diagnosis and the unfair treatment that uh, people with HIV and AIDS would receive in healthcare settings. So um, Rivera and Coleman are going to talk about their experiences in the next uh, sequence of clips. I'm allergic to, to sulfur drugs, which put, I can't take the um, Bactro, which is, which is the one I would love to take because it does the whole body. Because you can get peace, people don't realize it, but you can get PCP in other parts of your body too. But, but you know, but my strong will, I guess, and strong, used to be strong body, you know, has, you know, pretty, pretty well helped me, helped me along. The, along. But now I don't know because my body is just, you know, this last bout has just ravaged, you know, my old, my, I'm down to 153 pounds. I have more. I haven't weighed that in, since I was 15, I guess, 16. So it's a matter of me exercising and building my body back up, and I've never been a big exerciser, you know, and so it's hard, you know. And, and me here, be here by myself, you know, and if, I, if I had someone living here, maybe they would push me a little more. Uh, medicines, uh, AZT, uh, Nizoral, Bactrim, um, what is that, the Companitin? Companitin, uh, I'm on several antibiotics uh, for different, you know, for the herpes and other infections. Uh, right today, I'm taking like 14 different medications. Right? And sometimes, you know, with dealing with this, as far as the medical system, it's the kindness, you know, the gentle, you know, I don't want them to feel sorry for me or feel like, you know, it's hopeless, like they don't care, but it's just take the time and let them know that I'm here. It's me, you know, I'm a person. You know, uh, like I, I say, it's like, I'm a person with a disease, I'm not a disease. And as a last clip, we'll listen to Phil Coleman, who uh, discusses about how his diagnosis um, uh, affected him in ways that required him to defend himself even in a hospital. Yeah, I, I went and walked into the hospital and, you know, and, you know, read, they'll read a chart or, the, or the, for, they'll put you in the back of the line at the end of the line, you know, and stuff like that, you know, you know, you, you, know, you can feel it. Uh, one, of, one of the nurses said to me, oh, we take all the AIDS patients last. I said, I'm not an AIDS patient. I'm here to see the eye doctor. He said, yeah, but you have AIDS. And I said, if you say that again, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> so she shut up. You know, but that kind of thing, you know. You know, it's not, it's not blatant anymore because people are learning not to be blatant. It used to be very blatant. I never experienced blatant because I don't accept, you know, well, people wouldn't, won't do that to me, you know. I'm just, and I'm not a fighter, you know. I mean, I, don't, I hate fighting. I don't like fighting at all. I, I, I'll walk away before I fight. You know? But when people push you, you know, you fight. And uh, Kings County, there, there were a couple of incidents, you know, that were minor things, you know, about, oh, I have to put my gloves, I can't touch you. You know, those kinds of things, you know, which, which you just, you know, you just overlook. You know, by that time, it's, you know, this is into my third year of, of dealing with this. I, you know, these things people say just bounce off me, they don't even bother me anymore. But they, they still are saying things like that, you know, and, and believing it, you know. Well, you know, I'm, I'm simply protecting myself from them more, more than they need to be protected from me. Okay, and um, I'm just going to put up a last slide uh, that will stay up through the q and I don't want to cut too much more into that time. Um, but if you want more information about this collection, um, I have links to a couple blog posts that I and another archivist here wrote, um, as well as a link to uh, the Blind Spot podcast, which of course is why we're all here tonight. And if you haven't listened to it already, I, I highly recommend it. Um, so now I'm going to pass it back to Lizzie for Q&A. Wow, thank you so much. I would like to applaud. Uh, 
Um, I'm so grateful that the Center for Brooklyn History is doing this exhibit. Um, and what forethought um, that David Kahn had all those years ago when he put this together. It's really remarkable. So um, what a testament to what this place is and has been. Now we have time for just a few questions, um, but uh, let's make the most of it. So uh, there's a microphone is gonna be brought around to folks in the audience. Raise hands, anyone? All right, we have an eager hand over here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, thank you all for this amazing conversation. Um, I definitely lived through all of this in the 80s, having come of age in, the, you know, in my 20s, right around early to mid 80s. So my question is, just knowing that right now HIV and AIDS, um, the reason we don't talk about it largely is it's a poor people issue, right? Mm -hmm. It's people without economic means. And so, you know, the kind of economic piece of this is, which I'd love to know, and maybe you deal with this in the podcast, is how expensive is it now to get Proteus inhibitors? I mean, you know, and, and for people who need these drugs, how difficult is it for them to get the treatment that they need? That's a great question. And I am going to defer to uh, all these people here on the stage who probably have very, a lot of knowledge on this. But I, you know, who wants to go first? Which of you? Go Andy? Guys. You're the one actively treating people these days, I have so yeah. A lot to say about this, <laughs> uh, mm. but the, the the answer is that over the years, you know, this this term transition, like the the disease and how we adopted it, adapt, transitioned. Okay, so now, um, say in the world of pediatrics, it's most about our patients. I I still see my the kids that I care for, who are 35 and years old, but. The, Treatment, it's, it's affordable. This, this uh, ADAP, which is a drugs assistance program, got formed and basically was that if you are working and your drugs cost so much money, your drugs cost more than you made. So there is a, an allotment for, so you don't, you don't have to become desolate to get these therapies. So like ADAP will allow you to make, say, sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 a year and will pay for your medical costs, will pay for your drugs to make these available. It's working in New York. ADAP is a state program. So some, some states are not so good. I, you can leave it up to your imagination, which states are not that good at doing, at caring for this. Um, um, with respect to children, um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a good, can I tell a three minutes, two minutes story? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are developing drugs and we've developed HIV drugs for pediatrics through the years. And the, the treatment development always lagged the adults, sometimes three years, five years, seven years. And as a result of the advocacy by a lot of the HIV, pediatric HIV practitioners, the Elizabeth Gaza Foundation and other, the Clinton Foundation, there were attempts to lobby to make sure that if a drug company thinks that drug X, whether it be HIV or cancer, if there could be a potential use of that drug, as that drug is being developed in adults, the company has to develop a pediatric implement implementation plan. It can't happen as a second thought later on in the life cycle of the drug, because that would be typically a drug has seven years of patent. You, they don't have to do the PED studies until they six years. So all this advocacy work that we were talking about and actually got to, there was an executive order by President Clinton, didn't hold up because it's congressional, but there is a pediatric uh, de development plan that's congressionally mandated now. It got adopted, adapted pretty much in Europe. So when a drug goes to the FDA, the FDA can say, we're not going to approve this drug. Where's your pediatric data? That puts pressure on a company to do this and having it up front. And as the years have gone on, so luckily there are only about 40 or 50 babies being born infected in the United States per year, but the drugs have to get overseas. And you start talking about the costs of the drugs overseas, and uh, you have to figure like it, the manufacturer goes for like Bictarvi or Trimec, which is a three in one pill, it's about $5,000 a month. <clears throat> which is prohibitive overseas. Well, the forces came together and involved the Vatican, 
the World Health Organization, the advocates here. Um, and there were meetings about six, seven years ago in the Vatican about how do we get these drugs over there? And how do we make that happen? So, that, and I had a little thing that I put in here. One of the major drugs is dolotegravir. It's an integrase inhibitor. This became a drug that worldwide, WHO said, when this is available for kids, we want, it's the number one drug. It's an integrase, it's very safe. It's, it steps up from the inter, from protease inhibitors. Um, and there was a real pressure to make this happen. As the drug got approved by the FDA here in, 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 in increments, but now it's approved four weeks of age to 18 years old, the company was pressured to license the patent out to a nonprofit for, for sale in 160 poorest countries in the world. And so they gave the patent away. So now we're obviating some of the obstacles. The Clinton Foundation and other foundations paid for the development of the generic. So they paid for this to be developed, and it's a dispersible tablet, which has three drugs in one. Um, you put it in five mLs of water, and it would dissolve, and it's in increments. So you can go from little babies up to big people. Um, and at the end, so now it's approved. They then took the, had the generic and they got it approved by the FDA. Not for sale in the United States, but once it's approved by the FDA, a program like PEPFAR, which is the Presidential Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, can buy the drug and then use the PEPFAR as a seed money for developing HIV programs internationally in, 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 recent, in middle and lower income uh, countries. So, so these sites were set up, the sites got developed, and now the drug, this little tablet is now available because the, everything happened for $38 a year. So now the cost for treating a child who has HIV in resource limited settings is $38 a year. And PEPFAR is paying for that. And some of the countries are also chipping in. So in the last three years, we went from this is when you see Big Tarvey on TV or you see Devado on TV. That's what we're talking about. So there, we went from a very few, there are about six or 700,000 children on therapy worldwide for $35, $36 a year. And I mention that because PEPFAR is one of those programs that's a, a State Department program that some people have been looking to cut out of the budget. So I think that we need, there are about four or five, four or five million people worldwide depending on, dependent on that drug. For the first time, we can say, these children, one, it's one pill, one little session, once a day, three medicines, very well tolerated. But it's sort of, it's an expense. So I think there's been a lot of advocacy, like in the New England Journal, lead articles about the purpose of PEPFAR. It's very important. It's survived multiple attempts in the last couple of years. But, you know, we're not, so it's something. But the answer to the question is, a long answer is that we've developed systems to make sure that people get their drugs and can afford it and it doesn't decimate their savings, which is good because that certainly wasn't the way it was in the early days. Okay, so yeah. there's been a lot of transition and to yeah. think that, you know. But it is revealing that it, you've had to spend about 20, 30 years developing systems yes. to get the drug to be affordable. Uh, that, yes. you know, and that there are these programs even in the US to help people pay for drugs. That tells us a lot. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Hi. Hi, I'm Angel. I'm a student from New York Academy of Art. Um, I actually had a question for Andy. <laughs> um, with the use of stem cell research, how do you think the cure for HIV could change in the next decade? With the use of, can, can stem cell research change the, the core? Sorry, say it one more time, just a little bit louder, sorry. Our is not I'm here. just a little nervous. I'm no, sorry. that's okay. It's just that none of us hear well up here. Of course. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I don't. Um, with the use of stem cell research, mm -hmm. how do you think the cure of HIV would change in the next decade? Great. Yeah. I can talk about that. Yeah. So there are all these, and so here you are, you're taking a pill once a day. It will work if you take it a day, every day. Adherence is very hard. There's a whole host of adherence. With our perinatally infected, the vertically infected children, you know, at 9, 10, they were taking it. 
At 16, they're sitting there looking at medicine and say, I'm pissed off. Every time I take this medicine, I'm mad. So I take, the, I take it out on myself because I don't want to take the medicine because that's my source of applying my anger. And that's a real problem. So now they were in this world of taking these therapies and making long-acting injectables. So you look at Cabanuva, that's two drugs that are once a month or once every two months. If you take your medicines, you just have to show up. That's great, and then you will keep suppressed. That's a development. There's also development of, there's actually another drug. Actually, when we, we had a lot of our, our vertically infected patients on that, and they, were, and, they, and they came and they said, it's great, but I'm upset. I said, why? They said, because now I come in every two months and I get my shot. I don't even have to see you, and that's no good. And we, that was an unintended problem because then we weren't attending to their other problems, so now we make sure we see them. But there's actually another drug, lenacapavir, which is a, available for long-acting. It's an injection every 26 weeks, okay? Lenacapavir. It's every... It's every uh, yeah, it's, and, then, and, then, and actually, this whole setting, talking about transition, the company is now, this says drug that got approved last year, the company is now talking to the medicine patent pool about making the drug available through, by, by licensing a patent for, giving a patent away for, 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 for sale. So these are, these are really important things, and I think that, you know, I'm just sitting here representing lots and lots and lots of people who advocated and pushed over the years, and people pushed. And we got a little histrionic and things like that. But we're, we, it's actually getting better. And the work that we're doing now, malaria therapies and tuberculosis therapies and developing these drugs for children is going through the same process. So, you know, there were, it's really like how things build on itself. And it's very important to make sure that we don't lose the gains that we've had. And there were also people working with broadly neutralizing antibodies, which might be another injection, and people actually working on cure. If you can get, when the, someone's infected, you take your medicine, your virus is turned off, you're not replicating it, but this, the, the, the genetic material is still in, this, in cells. So if you can, resting cells, if you can eradicate the resting cells, kill them off. Try to go in there and say that one in a million cells that's in, that still has vir the genetic material, if we can wipe that out. That goes into a medical cure. So we're actually doing some of that work at Jacoby, um, and there are other people doing some of that work. And yeah, obviously a lot of places, both pharmaceutical and then there are the NIH groups that are working doing that. One more question. Okay, I have time for one more question. I see a hand in the back. Oh, shoot, I see two hands, but I'm going to, I saw your hand first on the right. I'm or you guys can duke it out. No. Um. I saw, I saw the young lady sitting next to oh, me. Thank you, Michelle, for stepping yes. in. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Thank Hi, you. my name is Carlota. I'm an HIV nurse. I'm curious, um, how do you think long-acting injectables are going to like change the HIV landscape? How long-acting injectables are yeah. going to change the HIV landscape? Yeah, that's what I was talking so about. That's Cabanuva. Oh, yeah, you go. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the long-acting injectables. Um, that's certainly an advance, and, and, and it's both on both sides. It's both on a treatment side, and it's on a prevention side. Mm -hmm. So there's PrEP, which is if you are not infected, you can involve in high-risk activity. You can actually take a drug to prevent getting a uh, getting HIV. Um, the problem with PrEP is adherence is terrible. At the beginning, everyone's excited, and six months later, half the, pay, half the people are saying, oh, you know, I forgot it. And so there's actually a long-acting injectable. It's called the Apitude, which is actually carbon, carbotegravir, part of Cabanuva, which is it's an injectable every two months. Trans, getting the virus it was reduced uh, to about 0%. So it's, it's using these things. We need other drugs because um, one of the drugs in, uh, in Cabanuva is propivirine, long-acting. A lot of people are resistant to that. So if you've been resistant in the past, that therapy won't work. So with the, there still needs to be more development. This movement towards not taking a pill every day is important. Um, there's a, a, a very well-respected HIV pharmacologist, pharma, pharmacologist who got up and said, you know, 
the treatments, it's not the patients who are failing the treatments. It's the treatments of failing the patients. Mm -hmm. Now we have it, it works, but really we need to get it into something that's more usable and taking HIV and making obviously, you take your medicines, this is, a, this is no longer AIDS, this is just having a virus infection that just needs to be controlled and get on with the rest of your life, um, which is an important thing to, to do here. So I wanna wrap up. Um, and I want to begin by thanking all of you remarkable, remarkable panelists. Thank you. I want to make one quick note, which is that um, thanks to the work of people like our three amazing panelists, HIV and AIDS, um, you know, the number of diagnoses has plummeted. There are treatments. People are surviving, they are thriving. Um, I think in the 2022, there are 1,624 diagnoses in New York State. That is far too many, and yet it is quite a success compared to where we once were. What's tragic is that uh, combined about 83% of those diagnoses were black and brown men, 18% were women. So we have a lot of uh, progress we still have to make. And yet, I don't want to end on a down note. What I want to say is, at a time right now which feels a little bit scary, where it feels like we're in the wilderness, where we don't know where the government's going to be, I really, these last few weeks, have been turning to people, in my mind, really thinking about people like Andy, people like Johnny, people like Michelle, who were in the wilderness at a moment when nobody really wanted to deal with this illness, when people did not want to touch people with HIV. They all fought, they built the infrastructure for treatment, for community, for survival. And so at this moment in particular, I think about all of you, I thank you all for showing the way, and thank you all for sharing your time tonight. Thank you all.